made his way here in 1981. Yes. Right? Yeah. And apparently, uh, the way he got here was through a pen pal. Yep. <laughs> uh, Modern day, what do they call it nowadays on, on Facebook? Facebook uh, <laughs> or. What's on here was through personnel that, you know, and writing, yes. <laughs> All right, and you've been with the, police, with the fire department for 25 years. Yeah. I've right. been in Waterville for 25 years, and I worked in Winslow for eight and a half years before I came to Winslow. Well, we won't hold that, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for your service. So, um, you know, you didn't come to hear me. Let's listen to the Lieutenant. Give us a nice time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope I can make this interesting for you all. Um, I started doing research uh, on the fire department back in probably in 2003-2004. Um, because like this young lady here, we used to go into the schools all the time. And the teachers, you know, have us for fire prevention. Um, they used to, the kids used to come to the Waterville station, you know, to take a tour of it. And in the new station, if you ever go into the main entrance to the new station, along the top of the wall you see fire chiefs. Well, out of the fire chiefs, there's like seven pictures missing. And the question was, the kids are always asked, what happened to these guys? Who are these guys, right? And that's when the curiosity hit me. Yeah, we've got to have pictures of these guys. So it started with just researching the fire chiefs. Well, then I found a lot more um, interesting stuff about the fire department in Waterloo in itself. Um, as you know, said, uh, I moved here in 1981 from Nebraska. Um, I live in Winslow, and I've been working for the Waterloo Fire Department for 25 years. I'm on my 25th year right now, and I worked in half in Winslow, and then before that I was a, a call man for four years. Uh, there's my wife, Ruth. We have two children and three grandchildren. Um, I became uh, interested in history in itself when I sit down talking to my grandmother. I have a grandmother that lives in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. She's 102 years old. She lives by herself. She still does laundry by herself, going up and down stairs all the time. She doesn't drive anymore because she don't like the way people drive. <laughs> so, she's, you know, so she gave up driving. Plus, you know, it gets harder for you know, like getting a driver's license for you to go all the time too. So we sat down one day and she was asking me, well, I was asking her basically questions about the family history and that's where it took off. And once I got into it, I was just so fascinated with anything to do with history. And that's how it happened in Waterville, like I was saying earlier. I looked at these fire chiefs and I'm going, you know, who are these guys? And then I got into the history in itself and I just fell in love with the whole thing. The fire department in history goes a long ways back, okay? <clears throat> and it starts off in 1809 um, in the record books, the only records that I could find. Um, as you know, Waterville split away from Winslow in 1802. Okay, but it wasn't until uh, 1809 that they decided uh, the prominent businessmen of the day decided to, you know, let's put something together to systematically, you know, fight fires in the city of Waterville because, you know, back in those days, you had no apparatus type of Stuff. So you had a bucket brigade, and one of the buckets is over here that they used back in 1809. <clears throat> so one of the first things they did when they got together in 1809, said we need to call ourselves something. So they called themselves the Taconic Village Corporation. Okay. Now this corporation would would charge the village of Waterville, as it was known back in the day, a certain fee, and they they would use that fee to um, Pay, pay the firemen, um, put uh, uh, cisterns throughout Waterville, and anything that comes up with the fire department, they, they can buy, okay? One of the first things they did is they bought this hand tub. Um, it's an 1810, or 18, 1810 uh, there. Now, this isn't the actual picture of it, because, of course, it's long gone by now. Um, so this is a, a hand tub that they would use. And what you typically do um, is you would fill up, this thing doesn't point on that thing, does it? This would be a tub right here. This is where they would dump water in, and then you got people that stand around and they pump the water. And then somebody would be on the other end with a hose and just squirt the water. So they did that for, for many, many years. Okay? And the first company uh, 
that I found records of. It's called the Bloomer. They call this, this hand of the Bloomer. Now, if you look through any history of any fire department in, in the United States, every machine back in the days of the hand tubs were given a name. Uh, there's Senator Baxter, there's, there's uh, many of them out there. We, Waterville had a few, and we'll, we'll get them in a second. And like I said, 1810, they decided to form a corporation. But it wasn't until 1836 that they decided, and they had to because uh, they wanted to charge um, more taxes so they could, you know, help the company out, the corporation. Um, and they used the money, like I said, to pay the company cisterns and equipment. Um, now the cisterns, or the reservoirs, uh, they were built throughout the city of Waterville. Um, we have a picture at the firehouse of some of them that were built. That was very little. They had, I have on my list, and I was going to bring it to you, pass it out, like close to 30 cisterns in this area. Anywhere, because they always couldn't run to the river, whether it be Nessalonski or whether it be Kennebec, to get the water, so they had to get from somewhere, so they dug big holes in the ground, you know, put a top on it, and then when they needed it, they flipped a lid, and dropped the hose in there, and off they go. And uh, the biggest cistern, of course, done by Castanguay Square, Castanguay Square, I don't know what, what the actual name of it is, but <laughs> I guess all different ways. Um, it was right there in, in 1974 is when they finally buried that one. Okay. <clears throat> so after a few years using the Bloomer, in 1837 they decided to buy this Huntington tub and they named it Taconic. Alright. <clears throat> and then they decided, well, to, to run the system a little bit better, let's hire a chief and an assistant chief. And that's how the men, uh, that's how they began with the chiefs and, and assistant chiefs. And the fire companies, Usually you had about 50 men per company, they were paid $150 a year on that company. So if you had 50 men at $150 a piece, that wasn't much you got a year. Of course, back in the days in the 1800s, it was a lot of money. Okay. This common hand tub still, exi still exists today. All right. I found it. Uh, it belongs to the Cigna Corporation in uh, Nor uh, New Orleans. The Fire Museum in New Orleans, if you go to visit it, you'll see this hundred. And this hunting has a sign on it that does state it was from Waterville, Maine. I contacted them, they will not sell it. <laughs> I love it to do it back here, you know. And then we talk about the first firehouses. We'll talk about firehouses a little sooner here, but the first the firehouses were down on the plains. And uh, the plains, as you know, would be water street. Okay? And that beverage is here somewhere. I just thought you were looking at it. She's a excellent uh, historian for anything to do with the plains in the Waterville area. And uh, she asked me a question, but I think I asked her more than she asked. Because she knows very much about it. Uh, so there was a firehouse down here, but any records that I could find of where the firehouses were, they never kind of really mentioned where they were. Okay, and we'll talk about some firehouses a little, a little later. In 1854, the Ticonic Village Corporation decides to buy another hand tub, and they call it the uh, Waterville 3. And Waterville 3 um, was an excellent hand tub. Um, back in 1854, they started what they called mustery events, where firemen would get together with their pumpers, their apparatus, and they would um, have a contest of who can shoot the furthest water using these hand tubs. Okay? This Waterville 3 was a famous one for Waterville because it, it would win prizes like there would be no tomorrow. One of the prizes is this silver trumpet that's sitting up front. Um, if you look at the day, this is 1854, and it was a, a mustard event they held in Augusta. Um, and there's three other ones upstairs. When I researched this and I found out they won some things, I came here to see Brian and look at what he has upstairs, and that's all those four. I, 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 I was like, I like to have one of them, you know, myself. But, um, so it, it did very well for the for the Tech County Builders Corporation. I mean, they did excellent work at the, you know, at the fires and stuff that it had gone to. Um, and as you can see, this tub was a little bit bigger than the hundred that you saw before. It took about thirty men to run this tub. Right? And I had a picture, a video on it earlier that I had kind of taken off because it was messing up my system here. But just picture the guys dragging this along. 
all right, to a fire, and you have to think about Waterville back in the 1800s. It wasn't as sprawled out like it is today. It was more confined in this area, so it wasn't too hard to drag this thing around. And then they would drop the handles down, and all the guys did was just do this for hours and hours and hours. Just pump them up and down, pump them up and down. And of course, you get tired, so that's why they had more men come in and help you out. Uh, Waterville did not just have this one here, of course. They had this one, the Hunman and the Boomer, all working at the same time back in the back at that time. Waterville did not have its first ladder uh, truck until 1855, um, and then it purchased a new one for 600 bucks in 1875. And you'll see pictures of that one if you walk around, if you look in the book and stuff like that. It was known as the Appleton Hook and Ladder number two. In 1865, they bought another hand tub. All right. It was built in 1962 for Charlestown, Massachusetts. Um, but it was never used. So Waterville got a great deal on this machine and they bought it up here. So the old Tychonic, the Huntington tub that was earlier, they renamed it the Veteran II and they named this Tychonic. This Tychonic exists today. It's in Ellsworth Fire Department. Ellsworth purchased it in 1888 and uh, they won't tell it either. <laughs> okay. Now in 1874, the Tychonic Village was falling on hard times. The corporation was having troubles with money because they were spending more money than they were actually bringing in. So the, the debt was getting bigger, of course. And so they went to the city of Waterville and said, hey, look, you know, you want to take over the fire department. Um, so in 1878, on August 2nd, 1878, $10,600 Waterville gave to the Tychonic Village to wipe out their debt. And that's when Waterville Fire Department totally begins to be owned by the city of Waterville. So 18, if you see all the patches that we wear, 1809 to you know, today, well, it was a Tetcomic Village first corporation, and then they sold to Waterville in 1878. So we had hand tubs, and what was one of the things they wanted the most was a steamer. The steamer came in 1884. But let's talk about a little bit about water supply. Back in the days, you know, in this area, all we had was Messalonis between Kennedy River and then Hayden Brook. Um, that's about the only place they could get their water. So they would create cisterns around the most populated areas. Some cisterns were actually filled through groundwater, uh, you know, underground springs that would refill them up, or they would have to use the hand tubs um, to go get water or buckets. They filled it any way they could to keep the, to keep the cistern full. Now, back in the day, they called them hogshead. Now, hogshead, um, one gallon is equal to, uh, if you're talking about a hogshead, 63 gallons is one hoghead. So if I said that, you know, a cistern had, you know, 100 hogheads, you know, that's over 6,000 gallons of water that it had in it. Okay. Um, so they were all over the place. Um, see how I have it here. Waterloo didn't have any um, hydrants until the late 1800s when the Smith and Meter Mill, which would be off of Front Street, is what I understood, they had put hydrants on their, on their property. And they wanted, you know, 1878 was before Waterloo purchased, so they went to the Dick Village Corporation and said, hey, look, we got these pumps in, we got this hydrant system. Do you want to use our water? But you would have to help us pay for it. And of course, that's when we were falling on a hard time. So the Tug Village said, no, I can't. You know, we can't help you out. We can't. We'd love to have all that water, but we can't. So it wasn't until the Lockwood Mills came in in 1875 that they built hydrants on their property. And then um, the fire chief back in the day, Chief Frederick C. Thayer, which is an important name because he was you know, the doctor in the area, and he was a famous uh, doctor around the end. Him and his men would meet up, have meetings with the Lockwood Mills, uh, to hopefully get them to run lines up Main Street, you know, Front Street, which they ended up doing. So in 1877, the Lockwood Mills would start connecting their lines from their you know, mills and run them up Front Street and then run them up Main Street. So now we had hydrants um, throughout the town, downtown area, to fight fires. Okay? And in 1878, <coughs> um, it was the, uh, the Waterville Works companies came to you know to bring 
bring water into the area. And uh, I read stories upon stories of how they wanted to do the work and how things weren't happening and all that kind of stuff. But in the long run, they ended up, the waterworks would be, we'd be taking water out of the Mescalancy River until 1899 when Kennebec Water District took over in this area. Because taking water from the Mescalansky, um, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right, I mean, was they started having issues with disease in the area. So, because it wasn't used, taking water from the Mescalansky River was not just for fighting fires, it was for public use. And people were starting to get sick from the water, so kind of big water stepped in and said, you know, we'll take it over, but we're going to take it from China. China Lake. They talked about Snow Pond. There's a big article about running from Snow Pond, but it ended up to be China Lake and the Water Bureau in 1899. So once hydrants came into view, um, that's when everything's, uh, the apparatus started not being used as much. Like I said, they had a steamer in 1884 that could hook up to a hydrant and have an endless amount of water, and the steamer works right to like a fire truck is today. That hydrant right there still exists today. Um, and I can't get the water district to actually go out and look at it to tell me exactly when it was put in and what it what it's used for because it's um, see what is it now it used to be it's on KMD it's got the uh, China buffet and you got the vape shop right next to it if you go out on that side if you go out on the left side of the building go out back you'll find this hydrant in amongst the trees the bushes and stuff. Um, Yes. We have out front one of the original hydrants from Lockwood. Yeah. So if you want to see what they looked like, it's not hooked to anything, it's just set in the ground, but it's out on the side out here. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah some of the, yeah, Brian contacted me a while ago, and I looked at a lot of the old pictures that I have of, of the area, and the hydrant match pretty close to what, pretty much dead on to what the Lockwood Mills used back in the day. And this, and the ones that you see, you'll see outside, was probably the same ones they used up and down Main Street and Front Street. So that's basically how they come up with water. So now we get into the horses. The horses are, horses are pretty cool in the city of Waterville. Uh, they had 22 horses in all, but 22 horses in and out of the fire department, in and out of the street department. Um, the hook and ladder in Waterville was the first one to use. The horses in 1855, the Waterville or uh, Village would not um, purchase any horses. So what they did is they rented horses from nearby stables. So if a call came in, the fireman had to run to the nearby stable, grab the horses, come get the car, and go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did that. They did that uh, quite often. Um, and with the advent of the hydrants, then you had just now a hose wagon. Because when a hydrant is sitting there, you know, when you come up back in the time with the hose, the hose carts, they would hook up to a hydrant and they just turn it on in full water. Today, if you see a fire, you see the hose go to a pumper truck and the pumper pumps it out to different mini lines. But back in the day, they, that's all they had and that's all they used. Okay. Um, and Waterville did not purchase, uh, see, they took over the fire department in 78. They would purchase, finally, some horses in 1885 because uh, Dr. Frederick Fair um, was adamant that his men were not going to pull, you know, a big steamer to a fire call. You know, those things, I don't know if you ever saw a steamer, they're, they're pretty heavy. And I don't think I've ever seen a steamer ever pulled, you know, by men um, or civilians or anybody, anything like that. So they purchased their first horses in 1885. I cannot find anywhere uh, in the records the names of these horses. So they were unnamed horses. <clears throat> the first horses I found that were named was Somerset, Lady Somerset and Tom Reed. Uh, it was assigned to Engine 110. In the first line of duty death of any body within the fire department was those two horses, Lady Somerset and Thomas Reed, um, in 19, 1900, in October. And I'm going to tell you an interesting story about this one. My granddaughter has heard this story many times. When I give a tour of the fire station, there's a picture on the wall that I start with, and this is how the story, the story goes. On October 5th, 19, uh, 1900, 
uh, there's a gentleman named George Proctor. He is the engine or the hose one driver. He was on a call. He was he was dispatched to a call um, on Pleasant Street at the high school. Now, of course, back in 1900, the high school would be down where it was, or as Hall is. All right. So he's going down the street, and there, it's reported wires down. Is what it was called. As he responds, as he's going up the street with his horses, the horses get near the scene and fall dead, they fall to the ground. He gets the horses back up, and then they fall again and die. They died of electrocution due to the dumb wire. Okay, so Lady Somerset and Tom Reed, both those names are on the memorial in front of the firehouse. Okay. Now George survives the call. Okay, he can get electrocuted. All right, but in June. Uh, of the following year, 1901, George has two new horses. And they're, they're named uh, Colonel and Major. Two of the smartest horses, according to all the records that I've ever read in the city of Waterville. Very smart horses, because when the bells rang, they knew exactly what to do. They go right to the car and were ready to go. So George is at a, at a fire call with his two brand new horses six months after this incident, just about, and the horses get spooked. He tries to control them, and they stop him to death. They run away. So George is the first firefighter in, in the city of Waterville to die in the line of duty with his brand new horse. So this is the story. His, his picture and his uh, badge that he wore is up at the firehouse. Okay. And the hook and ladder will also have a horse named Jet, who was responding to a call in 1903 that dies. That, that poor horse, and he was, he was uh, assigned with another horse, and as they were running, they were going up College Avenue to High Street when he collapses and dies on the way to the fire. So horses were a big part of the, the fire department. They were well kept. They were they were the pet of the, of the city. The firemen, you know, didn't like you know if anything happened to the horses. And of course, yes, they had a Dalmatian at one point in time, but they had other dogs. Now the the, the dogs, and you hear about Dalmatians and horses, is because at fire calls. <coughs> When you're at a fire call, the horses stand there for a long period of time, and they, you know, but the dogs kind of help them out, like comfort them and all that kind of stuff. There, there's a science to it, I don't know exactly, but they did a good job of that. And like I said, they, well, 21 horses, I lied, I said 22, but those are the names of the horses that Waterville had in the years that they were around. And uh, the first two you see on the left, that's Colonel and Major, and I couldn't find, uh, that was in 1910, those horses on the other side. So they could, you know, they could be anywhere from Nancy, Buster, or Billy, and all that. You know, so. <laughs> the biggest one I, I read about was Maud. Other than, you know, Major and Colonel, Maud was one that the firemen, they loved her to death, but she just wouldn't do her job right. So, <laughs> and, and, as you notice, she was only there for a year. And most of these horses, most of these horses, were between, you know, it's, it's, it, once they got to their use of the fire department, then they went to the street department and being used there. Or they were sold to private people who use them on their farms and things like that. Um, I do have, <clears throat> I do have, um, and I don't have it up there, the home, uh, I, I wrote to Ann one time, looking for this farm because Major and Colonel are buried on this farm. I can never find out where it was. And, uh, uh, so. The other things that the horses were used for, even the fire department was used for, of course, back in the day, you know, you see Major and Colonel standing on dirt roads. And that was dirt roads throughout the city back in those days. So what did they do to keep the dust down? They ran the sprinklers. The sprinkler trucks would come in. The fire horses would pull the sprinklers. The firemen would go take their horses, to the nearby where they, they stored the sprinklers, hook them up, and they would sprinkle the road. If a fire call came in, they raced back to the firehouse and put the horses on the cart to go to the fire. <laughs> and there's many stories in the new and upcoming book that has all those kind of interesting stories and stuff like that. So horses were a big thing back in the day. Of course, the last horse to leave was in 1928, because that's when became fully motorized. So. Now, the fire alarm system. Uh, outside, you notice there's a, there's a pedestal out there with the fire alarm on top of it. And 
there is another picture down there. Um, fire alarm in this area was is, it was it was very interesting. Um, Brian brought out the the watchman's rattle, and basically it was used by the police department because uh, they always had guys on foot patrol. And uh, can, you, can you use it? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Whenever there was a fire, they noticed that they started rattling this thing off. Trust me, that was the first time I heard that too. <laughs> I've seen them many times, but I've never tried one. So. I used to rattle it at the school kids. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a bit tough, I mean. um, so that's what they did. They, they, they had a, like, a, you know, like a fire watch, and that's what they would do. Of course, now as water would grew, they needed something different. So now they started using church bells. Uh, the church, the, the Baptist Church on Water Street, the uh, <coughs> silver, silver Street up here, the one at the point there, the Lutheran Church, and then the Catholic Church, uh, St. Francis. Um, and what, what they would do is they would, wherever the fire was in a certain area of town, they would start ringing the bell and just going right to town with it. Okay? And, the, and the, um, the city would pay them $50 a year you know, per, per church the, for the use of the bells. Um, but in 1887, um, be Frederick there decided he was going to install some bells. Uh, that's when electricity was coming about and all that stuff. And so the bells would be just in the firehouses. So if so, if, uh, Water Street had a, a fire in the, in the church, and, and Water Street would, would ring its bell, they would set off the, the bells inside the firehouse down there, and they would ring it to the other firehouses. Okay. Um, but they wanted something more useful, so they looked into a system, and it was called the Game Hall Fire System, which is a very popular system, still used to this day. And as you see, and probably most of you have seen these things on the poles when you were growing up, okay, fire alarm boxes. Now this is fire alarm boxes. Um, this one here, I think is number 20, 22. 22 on it. Okay, you run up to the box, you pull the thing, you pull the lever down, and you can hear the thing that you, you, you know. And then you would listen for the big whistle on top of the fire station back in the day. It would burn, burn, you know, it gives out two blows and then two more afterwards, and then it didn't do nothing. And did it three more times. That was, the, you know, the box coming in from 22. And if you had a list, because most people get lists in their kitchens and refrigerators, find out where the fire was, because everybody knew back in the day when it was a fire call because of the whistles. Um, <clears throat> But before that, when Waterville put the first system in in 1892, um, they paid $2,300 to have the system put in, and it was finally installed in December of 92. All they did was, it would, when somebody would pull the thing, it depended on which part of the city it was in, like back in the days of the, of the guy ringing the bell at the, at the churches, it was hooked up to the church bells, and it would dong the number. I don't know exactly how it do it, because, I mean, just the way they did it, but the way they set it up. So the church bells was a, was in the city was the biggest use for the fire department. So, um, and then I have a little story there in 1893. Just just the following month, somebody noticed there was on Cremant Mills. My Cremant Mills is correct right hand if I'm right. It was off of Cool Street in that area, um, and. Uh, there was a, uh, a factory down there, and uh, they had a big fire, and somebody ran out and pulled the box, box 56, and uh, that was its first use of the box alarms coming in and stuff like that. And this is probably what most people would have on their refrigerators and stuff. As the years went on, more boxes were added and, and stuff like that, so it became to be an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and it had all these numbers. And the fire alarm wasn't used just for the fire alarm itself. It used to be used for civil defense. It was used for school closings or or anything else that you know they wanted to use them for. So, that's the famous picture from outside there. That's yep. the one that you see outside. There is still one left in the city of Waterville. Um, I'm assuming it was put in in probably the early 1900s um, at the, the Stonway Square, Castleway Square. If you go down there, um, you take a, you know, you know I'll treat right now is one way. You go down one way and you take a left. You look on your left hand side, there's the pedestal. It looks just like that. That box is still in existence. It's the only one on the street. Um, all the other boxes have been taken out in 1980. Okay. 
Is it still active? That one is still active, yes. It's the only, I've been in, this is my 25th year, it's pulled, been pulled three times. Never for fire though. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody said, wow, this thing is old. It hasn't been in a while. Makes you know we get the bells and stuff like that. <laughs> and of course, because of those false alarms, in 1894, they decided to make ordinances and charge people, you know, a certain amount of money if you were caught, you know, ringing a bell for no fire at all or anything like that. Or planning on the system. In 1904 is when they decided the new one do an auxiliary backup because if something happened to the original fire alarm system, they would have a backup. And that's what I think Brian has upstairs. He has the board that they used back in the day, the fire alarm board. And that used to be out behind the fire alarm. Um, and then they started, um, they wanted to get away from the church bells. They wanted to have the new and upcoming air horn whistle. But Waterville could not decide what to, where to actually put it but on, on the uh, on City Hall. Um, do they want to, they can't put it on the firehouses. Uh, at that time, Central Fire Station was downtown um, near where TV Bank of North is today. That's where the original fire station first sat. The buildings were just not strong enough to hold this compressor and all that kind of stuff. So it was either City Hall. They even thought about using, you know, Hollingworth and Whitney across the river in Winslow. So they just couldn't figure out what to do. So they stuck with just the bells of the um, of the churches, and they were decided to spend some money and put bells and fly in the firemen's houses. So if somebody pulled a box. If, if I was a fireman at home and I had a bell in my house, it would go off. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And of course, in the, the invention, uh, intervention of 911 system and pagers and everything else that come along, in 1980, Waterville took, off, uh, took out all the boxes in the city of Waterville that was on poles throughout the city. There is still boxes, um, but it's if you go by City Hall, it still has a box outside, box 25. Um, but the schools have them, um, churches have them, um, your businesses in town have them. We have a list that it used to be, in, you know, if you've seen the original list from back before 1980 when they always had them, right? It was eight and a half sheet. Now we got a sheet like this big at the firehouse, you know, that has all these numbers on it. So it's hard to memorize a big list like that compared to a list like you had here back in the day. You know, you just had a few boxes. And when the bells would ring in, the first, if some of them you knew right off, Box 17, that's just their hospital. So if then Box 17 comes in, I know when they're hospital. But um, some of the boxes that don't come in very often, you, you know, the minute you listen to the bells ring, you know, you, you run up, look at your list, and see where you're going. So, yeah. Now we're going to talk about going through the water well. <coughs> and, uh, they decided in 1984 um, as to, to buy the steamer. The steamer is up in the right-hand corner. That firehouse right there is actually on, used to be on Silver Street. Um, it was used. It was torn down in the days of what they call urban renewal. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of a lot of a lot of good buildings went down around that time. I wasn't around, but I read as they read about it, and I see. But anyway, so that, you know, steamer was there, but it was also downtown. Uh, things got moved around constantly at, at, at all times. Um, so they, 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 they uh, purchased the steamer. Now, the steamer was used quite often in Waterville, but with more and more fire hydrants being added to the lines and more hose wagons like, like uh, John Mulholland is driving right there. Now, that's the firehouse that was on Main Street. Right next to it, with all the windows behind the cars, is, is the hose, is the hook and ladder truck um, house. So that was the original central fire station. When they had a lot of these hose carts, all they did was just using hydrants upon hydrants. So the steamer wasn't used very often, but the steamer did a lot of mutual aid calls. The steamer left Waterville constantly to go to other to other cities and towns in Maine to fight fire, and they the way to transport it was a fire train. There's always a, an area over at the railroad yard set up, so if uh, somebody called for it, they'd get permission to 
the chief would get permission from the uh, mayor at the time. The mayor said, yeah, you know, we can let it go out of town. So they would send the steamer over to the train. They'd load it up on the train and off they went. The steamer uh, went to Lewiston at one point in time. It went to Augusta a few times. But it went everywhere. But the biggest one they went to was 1911 when Bangor had their huge fire. And uh, they were up there for three days. Helping Bangor out with the city fire that they had. So the steamer went out. The steamer, um, I got a phone call probably around 2005, 2006 from a gentleman called Andy Swift. Now Andy Swift, he lives in Hope, Maine, uh, originally from Waterville. He's, um, excuse me, Winslow, and he, he uh, restores antique fire apparatus. He called me up one day and said, I got a steamer down here. Now I've never met Andy before. So, but he found out that I was doing um, the research on the history of the Waterville, so he asked me to come down and take a look at the steamer. So I came down with all the photos that I had of the steamer, and we sat down with a uh, magnifying glass and stuff, and we matched up the pictures of this steamer to the steamer that he had sitting right in front of me. Um, it was found in a field in um, Pennsylvania. Some guy from Ohio came across it, um, asked questions about it, and the farmer sold it to him. And so he brought it here to Maine for Amy Swift to work on. And that steamer, along with the Taconic from Ellsworth, came here with 2015, 2006, 2015. I don't know if any of you came down to the firehouse when it was here. Um, the gentleman from Ohio who owns it and will not sell it. I <laughs> 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 tried. Um, he wanted to have a picture of it from the house that it ran out of, um, you know, for nostalgic reasons and stuff. So I decided, well, we're going to have an open house at the Waterloo Fire Station. Why not have, you know, the steamer here? And then I, then I I know some guys very well from, from Ellsworth, so I called them up to see if they would bring the Taconic up here. So we have a picture of the Taconic and the steamer sitting out front of the central fire station with horses in front of it. Now, when you see those, when you see the picture, the horses are not attached to the machine. Because if, if, the, if the horses got spooked and took off, <laughs> that poor old machine didn't want to ruin, you know. So Andy did a beautiful job on this steamer. Um, it's, it was beautiful. Shiny. They sat on did a huge article on it, and I was glad they did. Um, but the steamer is owned by a gentleman in Ohio, and he, he has a fire museum down there of steam apparatus, and that's why he has it. And he did a good job on it. And like I said, the hand tubs, Titanic bought ours in 1988. The, the veteran two in the bloomer um, in 1889, I found that they went down to some place in southern Maine. Which this little town doesn't exist anymore, but that's what it was written in the, uh, you know, in the newspaper. Um, and then, of course, in 1891, Waterville Three went to Newton, Massachusetts. That's the only apparatus I cannot find, and it was the, I lose track of it in 1986 when it was sold in an auction, and I cannot find it. Um, so you know, we do a lot of stuff on Facebook and stuff like that. So there's a there's a site about hand tubs and horse-drawn apparatus, and I put all kinds of information out there trying to find this tub. This guy calls me up about it. Well, uh, he's also looking for it. <laughs> he, he's from Newton Fire Department, you know, Massachusetts, and they're looking for it. I said, well, I hope I find it first before you do. <laughs> I said, because I'm striking out everywhere. Every time I find, I find one, they don't want to sell it. So, <clears throat> And I, I got down here at the bottom of the scene. Walter Berry, who, uh, very stationary and stuff. He was a fire chief and he was chief for 25 years. And he was a very active fire chief, um, even though he ran his business and stuff. He did so much for the city of Waterville when it comes to the fire department. He had um, a lot of do with the codes that, that we have um, in our ordinances. Um, he has, you know, he started, he, his biggest thing at the time was to get the new central fire station. Um, because that fire station, like I said, sitting on Main Street where T Bank is north uh, today, um, was getting deteriorated. And uh, so he was adamant for years and years to get in a new firehouse. And of course, in 1911, they decided to build a firehouse and it was finished on January 25th, 1912. And all the apparatus moved into it, except for course the, the hand tubs were all gone by then. But the interesting story about how Central Fire Station was built was because of the post office. 
post office that sits at the square today, uh, the government purchased all that land. In, in the articles that I read, it was known as the heater land, the heater property, they kept calling it. And in amongst the heater uh, property was the firehouse. So the government says, we want to build you a new post office. We need land. So they bought all the land around this area, and part of it was the central fire station. So they came in and said, you know, you need to move out. And at the time, that's all they had. Waterloo didn't have anything. I mean, they had Water Street, they had Silver Street, and they had Tyconic Street. And um, so they had to quickly do something. And so they they sold the, um, the Silver Street Fire Station, and they sold these two buildings to somebody, you know, to pick them up and move. So they had a little bit of cash in pocket, so they kept fighting and fighting for pieces of land. And uh, the guys wanted where the fire station sits today. Next door was Kent's Head, as we know. Uh, at one point, when I came here, it was Kent's Head. But back in the days, it was uh, well, the water motor, right? It was, the bowling alley was upstairs, yes. Yeah. bowling alley was upstairs. But when first it was taken over in that area, it was the water. Uh, they sold vehicles, stool bakers, and all that kind of things. That was what the firemen wanted, but the city didn't want that area. They wanted something further out of town because they didn't want an ugly building sitting down there in their, their, their downtown. So Waterville Motor comes in and buys the property. So the firemen fought for the next property over, which was called the Bartlett property. Um, and finally the city finally gave in and said, yeah, we'll build you a new station, we'll put it here. But in the meantime, when their building was torn down and brought away, or brought, um, some of it was hauled away, some of it was torn down, they had to use the Elmwood hotels, stables, they had to use other stables around the uh, area to house the apparatus because they had a fire station. And so when they built Central Fire Station and opened it in 1912, they finally had a place to put everything. So. Now fire apparatus, um, you know, when we talk about the pumpers and the steamers and stuff, motorized apparatus came in 1915 when they paid $4,800 for a uh, fire truck and basically it was a chemical truck, it had two tanks on it that, that had uh, specialized chemicals in it and then it had a bunch of hose on it and, that, and, and they would drive it um, you know, to fire calls and they would drop the hose on the street and stuff like that and uh, you know, lay it to the fire. Waterville purchased their first motorized apparatus for a ladder truck in 1922. Um, in 1927, this apparatus you see here is called the Walter E. Reed. It was a Mac, 1927 Mac. Uh, it was donated to the city of Waterville uh, from Walter, uh, Walter E. Reed. And there's something to do some history on Walter E. Reed. He had a lot to do with this area. I haven't really got into it too much, but he was like a, you know, like a, like a Frederick Thayer and Appleton and all that. You know, his name comes up all over the place. And of course, in 1928, they finally become all. all motorized and, and the, uh, the whole city had apparatus motorized there. And here's some of the pictures of them. 1922, that was the, that was the ladder truck, that was the Stutz. You had the 62 American in the France. Th these are just a few of them throughout the years. So, you've probably seen a lot of these on the road at one point in time. <laughs> you know. I, I know where some of these apparatuses are to this day, but some of them, I, you know, like the studs, the 22 studs, I would love to find it, the 62 American, uh, the Sea Graves. Um, Andy Swift owns um, Waterville's Engine 4. It was 1955 American France. He owns that one. But she's in really bad shape. <laughs> so. Now, firehouses, we talked about Central Fire Station, how it came to be, but they also had. Um, the two on Main Street, the, uh, the hose one, uh, and the Appleton Hook and Ladder was down where uh, TV Bank North is. Um, Silver Street was, was hose too. Now if you look at what's the uh, resale store that sits in, it used to be Steagles back in the day. Some of you remember. All right, if you come over just a little bit to the right, that's where the firehouse sat. Um, if you look at old maps, um, put me wrong, uh, and Kenbeck. Kenbeck Street used to come up to meet Silver Street. Because, uh, not that, I don't have a picture of that firehouse, but the firehouse sat right on the corner at Silver Street and Kenbeck Street. If you look at, um, well, I can't. If you went to uh, the city council, you see that big, huge wall. And uh, Burger King has one, the exact same 
picture in the, in the entry. The big city. If you, if you look at what used to be a rotary downtown, right, and you look over and you see Kennebec Street comes up the main street, you can see the firehouse in right there. So that was the engine two. Uh, engine four um, sat on Tyconic Street. Um, it, it was first built in 1892, but it was torn down and they redid it in 1957. Uh, the Western Avenue Fire Station, Engine 5, which is today what well, Engine 5 Big House. Yeah, and then Central Fire. I put Union Street in there because for a short period of time, um, Waterville in 1999 purchased a 100-foot uh, aerial ladder, which we still have today, the, the tower. There was no place to put it. You know? So they, they uh, bought some property up behind the firehouse and they built this the station we called, I called it the Union Street Station because it was on Union Street. And all it housed was the fire truck, uh, the, uh, the fire, uh, the tower truck at the time. Um, of course, when the renovation of uh, Central Fire in 2003, um, everything came up. You know, we finally had a place to put the tower up near Central. You know, it would have been quite high, too. Yeah, you want to be found. You want to be found. Go down to the Union Street. Now, all these stations, they closed down either 1980 or 1980. The last one was closed in 1981. Now, you notice Western Avenue, <coughs> which, hold, which held Engine 5, which did a lot of airport runs uh, because there used to be an airline service that came in and out. I so, have the keys to Water Street Engine 3. Yeah, you do. Oh, and you can have them. Oh, I thank you very much. I, and that's the thing. I do collect uh, people come in all the time with stuff. And uh, I'm sorry, Brian, but I can't turn them out of you. We'll get off someday. If you walk in the, <laughs> if you walk in the central fire station, you go on the, on the second floor of the old station. Anything on the walls, the things that have been given to me, now, I can't leave them sitting in a box. I can't leave them anywhere else. They have to be up on the walls and have to be explained to what they are. Um, I did a huge fundraiser. Um, years ago to put a plaque on Central Fire Station. It gives a little history. When people walk by, they can look at the sea and read the history about Central Fire Station, how it was built and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we had a memorial. We did a huge fundraiser to put the memorial out front because we have, you know, firemen that died in the line of duty and we also had, you know, firemen that, you know, passed away but, but they were still active. They either died of cancer or automobile accidents, things like that. So, to me, these guys can't be forgotten. They had to be something. Because the, you used to walk in the central fire station and you, there, there was nothing, basically. So now, you know, people walk up and see the memorial, they can ask questions about who these people were, and that's what I want. You know, things like that. But anything that, that I collect, I keep, and I, some, I use, um, something that can be, be displayed. Like someday I'll have a trumpet I can display at central fire. <laughs> It's like trying to buy the apparatus. I can't buy the apparatus. <laughs> Maybe someday, was, uh, talking to Brian, you know, the old engine four that Andy Swift had down there, and he said I can have it at any point in time. And, you know, she'll be never roadworthy unless you want to spend you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars to get her on the road. Um, but she can be put in the building for somebody to look at. And someday I'll have to have a museum. That's what I really like to see for it to be. In. Not just that apparatus, but anything else that we may get along the way. Okay. But I was going back to Western Avenue. They built it in 1972 because of a lot of airport runs and stuff. Well, the, the airline that came in and left all two or three times a day decided not to run anymore. So, Engine 5 out, out that time, I mean, it ran a lot of calls, but it, it wasn't very um, busy, busy department. You notice it closes nine years later. These buildings, um, other than the one on Silver Street, Engine 2, uh, all the buildings are still existing today. I got to, two or three weeks ago was the first time I got to go inside the Water Street one. Of course, I mean, it's a private home now, so it isn't yeah. set up as... You put as, in new doors in the front. Yeah, you put in new doors in the front. So, it was actually kind of nice to see, you know. Things like that. Now, fire personnel, I know I'm long-winded, but... <laughs> Um, I can only go back to 1836. That's, uh, there is some written stuff in books. Um, the, bicentennial, it was the Bicentennial 1902 that Waterville has. It talks a little bit about the fire department, but not a whole lot. Um, but the first true Waterville fire chief uh, that you know, the city took over was Willard B. Arnold. Um, that name is a big name because of the 
hardware store, but you also had the president, um, was it Will be Arnold the third here, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, um, and basically, when he left the, the department, um, when he retired from the department, they gave him a gold badge, and that still exists today. Will be Arnold uh, was the fourth, and now down the line, he has that badge. Been trying to get a picture of it um, because I actually seen a grainy picture of it, a black and white picture, but I like to see the original. Girls, could you give us a picture? I have a picture of it. Yeah, a picture of it. Yeah, it's, it's still existing today. I, I saw a grainy picture of it, but well, I like to have the original. I uh, made a clear picture, I should say. So, it's great. It's great. And Willoughby Arnold was, he was a, uh, a real, also go-getter back in the, you know, uh, in the early days when Water took over the fire department of the Tycom and Village Corporation. So he was the first chief that, uh, we recognize for the city of Waterville, um, even though, you know, <clears throat> in all my records, we had more, there was a, quite a few more chiefs on the take off of this point inside of it. And some of the other famous chiefs that we've had was Frederick Thayer, uh, Josiah, uh, Drummond Hayden, and then Alberton Plaza, uh, no, Luke Ivers, and Walter Berry. Now, Luke Ivers was a, um, he was an interesting man. Two, two years ago, his great great granddaughter came, his great granddaughter, excuse me, came to the firehouse and she wanted to know history about her, her great grandfather and she hadn't come in on the right day. Because <laughs> Luke Ivers, even though, you know, Walter Berry and Alton and, and Fred, they, they all fought fires, okay? But it was Luke Ivers in his section of town where they used to be what they call smoke eaters. They never wore the air packs on their back. They would put on their, their fancy rubber coats and the boots and they'd go right into a fire and they would eat a lot of smoke in, 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 in fighting fires and stuff like that. So he, there's tons of stories in the local newspapers about this guy. And, you know, he was his injuries that he get, but he would just keep on going. Walter Berry, I, I kind of our new fire chief Sean Esler, I kind of call him Walter once in a while because <laughs> Sean is a go-getter. He he wants to improve everything for the citizens of Waterville. Same thing as Walter Berry. Like I said earlier, Walter Berry created a lot of the ordinance and codes that you would have here for fire stuff. He did a lot of that. Uh, a lot of those first, the first uh, full-time chief came in 18, or 1981 with Frederick Brown, um, and he retired in 1999. Um, he was a third generation within the department. His grandson, Dan, works with us today. Um, and then we had the LaCroix family. Uh, as, as, uh, another kind of a family history type thing in here. Um, the first chief that was hired from out of town, not with, within the department, was Daryl Forney in 1999. He came from Freeport, um, excuse me, 1990. He left in 1999 and went back to Freeport as a fire chief. <laughs> so, and then, of course, in, in 2004, um, when they were looking to save money, because Ray Poulin, um was, was a fire chief at the time, he retired. In the, Mayor LePage did not want to really hire another chief, so he went to Winslow and they did made up this deal to, to own have a, chief, a joint um, fire chief. And he left in 2008 and then Dave LaFountain took over until 2018, no, yeah, 2018 Dave left. And then now we're split back up again. Winslow has our own, we have our own. It was actually kind of hard because the fire chief would be in Waterloo for half the day and then he'd be over in Winslow for half the day. So you never, you know, it was, it was hard because we don't run the assistant fire chiefs. Um, there was assistant fire chiefs way back in the day. The last time Waterville had one was in 1994. Was their last assistant chief? 1999. No, excuse me, 99. Because Ray Poulin was. Uh, it was a, we only had two full-time assistant fire chiefs, Bruce and uh, Raymond. All the rest were always. Uh, our department runs career and call. Okay. We have 15 career firefighters. Uh, we have three shifts of five. So there's five guys on duty today, five tomorrow. But if somebody goes out sick on vacation, work with four. Can never work with four. The other uh, people that we have on the fire department are called call firefighters. And they respond like a volunteer. They will, they will respond um, and get paid for the hours that they work. Okay. So and we rely on them quite heavily because. Um, when we leave the station, we're all having an apparatus, and it's kind of hard to fight the fire when you're running just an apparatus. So. 
first fire chief was A.C. Crockett, um, uh, at, well, first driver, uh, because in 1885 when he got the horses for the steamer, they needed somebody to run them. So A.C. Crockett was uh, Crockett was the first one that they hired. In 1960, a guy named Don Pooler was hired to be a tailgate man, and all his job was to, he was ready, he was packed up and ready to go into the fire as soon as he got there. Uh, we don't have that luxury anymore, because back then they had seven men and we get five. George Proctor, I talked to him. I talked about him. He dies in 1901. His horses, Ernest Clark from the Ladder Company, in 1927. Uh, he was. They had an early morning fire. Uh, they came in about four o'clock in the morning. He slides down the fire pole too fast. He breaks his leg. Right now, back in the day, you you could bring your boots with you to bed. Okay. Back in the day, when you when, when you fought fire, you never cleaned your gear. You know. The dirty your, your gear was, the most, you know, people looked at you as the most progressive firefighter, you know what I mean? <laughs> Nowadays we don't do that because of the cancer. So his boots were, you know, they had the linings in them that were pretty nasty from fires. He breaks his leg, has his compound fracture, gets blood poisoning, and dies a month later. Oh, it's Now Willard, uh, Willard Godden, uh, into one company, I met his grandson, um, when we had the uh, memorial service in 2016, we had the memorial service out front of the station because his, because uh, Millard's name was on there, and uh, and that's George Proctor's the first one. Millard is the second one. Over there. I don't have a picture of Ernest Clark. I contacted his granddaughter, and nobody has a picture of him. So I haven't found it as of yet. But in 1929, um, it was not. And of course, you've probably seen it many times. Back in the city of Waterville, back in the days, the firemen used to ride on the back of the trucks. Mm -hmm. They were going, they were going to Clinton for a fire call, and, and, and Millard was on the back. He only been on the farm less than a year. He gets on the back of the fire truck, and as they were going over railroad tracks in, in Fairfield, he gets knocked off and hits a telephone pole. Oh, no. So he ends up dying. So this is the three that, that, that Waterville's had. It's uh, well, when I first got on in the farm in, in Winslow in 1982. That was the fun thing to do, was to ride on the back of the fire truck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the only time you don't ride on the back of the fire truck is in the middle of the winter. Way too cold, very cold. And then, uh, we've had, we had a 21 men at one point in time, in 1992 they laid off three, and then again in 2004, so today we work with 15. Uh, the firemen would unionize in 1966. And, uh, the first female firefighter was hired on the call force in 1981. The first female firefighter starts Monday. We had, we had somebody uh, resign a few months back, and so they did a hiring process. And a young lady from, I think she's from the Thompson area, beat out all the guys. So she, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Waterville has to work up uh, Monday morning. She has to work. Monday through Friday for three weeks, you know, for training and stuff. And once she gets through all that, then she'll be put on a shift, 24 hours. We work a 24-hour shift, and then we have two days off. We work a 24, 48. So every third day, you work. So if you look at it, at a calendar, you work 10 days a month. <laughs> but you typically don't because this, this, the station is very, very busy. Um, in 1967, Waterville decides they're going to buy an emergency medical unit truck. Um, the rescue truck in 1967. Um, today, that truck runs 4,100 calls a year, and I put on there because they just did a they just did a, uh, a survey. Um, the uh, EMS uh, division of the main state they did a Waterville is the busiest non-transporting department for rescue in the state. I personally sometimes, I wish they would go to transport. Uh, it may be coming up. I know the yeah. chief wrestler is, is going to fight for it. I next love Tuesday it. night. What's that? I understand it's next Tuesday night. Okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's one of those things they should have done years ago. You know? I mean, when you're looking at 4,100 calls, and you get nothing for it, basically. <laughs> I like to see transport myself. So, that's kind of the... And of course, some of you guys, I put some of these fires in there because some of you all know some of them. The Coburn School, uh, the Haines Theater, that's probably one of the most fun, a lot of those. 
Hotel Hama, back, Hama back in the day. That one up there is the South Grammar in 1906. Of course, that's the Sisters Hospital, which is now uh, Mount St. Joseph's. And then, of course, Colton, which is on Elm Street. You probably look at a lot of those up there, and these brings back a lot of memories. Now, the Waterville High School one is where it sits on Gilman Street. That was that school was less than a year old when they caught fire. And that's an interesting. All these will be in the next book that I have coming up because every one of them is interesting in, in how the fire was fought because it's totally different then as it is now. You know, when you see a lot of pictures from the age, from the early 1900s and stuff, and you look at a, you know, well that one, the school doesn't have it, but if you, Colby College, um, when it was downtown, had a few fires, and there's some fires of, of private residents too. One of the first things you always saw in those pictures was furniture outside. Okay? You had time, if you had a fire in your house, to take your furniture out, basically. Of course, you lose some stuff. But let's say you had a fire upstairs on the second floor bedroom. You had enough time to wipe out just the whole first floor. You know? You look at these pictures in the 1900s, when Jesus, well, today, everything is built with plastics and polymers and all that stuff. And what happened? Back in the day, you could, for this room to catch completely on fire would take, what do you say, more? 15, 20 minutes more? Yeah. You know, at the time, even longer. Nowadays, it's three minutes. With all the all the stuff that we have in our homes, it you go up so fast, you won't have time to, you know, the only time, the only time you've got is to get up and go. You don't have time to grab nothing and go because it's, it burns so hot and so fast nowadays because of all the plastics and the polymers and everything else. So when you see pictures, uh, sometimes you want to probably get those furniture out. You know, they didn't have that stuff back then. Now with, there's some more fires. That was Hope to Elma at the top, and of course, the fatal fire at the Jefferson, um, which is, uh, when I was here, was uh, John Martin there. Okay. Um, fatal fires, all, all the recorded ones that I could find was in 64 of them. And these are some of the most uh, written ones. Um, some of them you've probably already seen. The one that kind of really gets me a lot is in 1954 on King Street. The house still exists today. Uh, it's vacant, um, but it's still there where five kids uh, perish in the fire. Um, 1991, we had an unsolved fire to this day. Um, and then 1922 was, was the biggest one for Colby. Um, um, you know, where the police department is now, because that's where Colby was in 1922. They had four men die in the dorm fire. So. But the interesting one, in 1935, I said the, the Rainforest Block Fire, and people really, you know, I don't. I wish I had to put a picture up here for you. It was in the dead of winter. It was cold as all hell. And, and everything was ice. It was just totally ice when you see the picture. So they had this big fire. They finally get it put out after hours upon hours of fighting fire. Following morning, um, it was I should say following two months later when they did, when they could get inside the building to clean it up, they find the body. In it. So and they didn't know, you know, it wasn't uh, at that time. It was a business. It was no wall or anything like that. And it took them quite a while to figure out who this guy was. Uh, and then the Lockwood Mills, one of the first ones in 1889. Um, one of my wife's relatives, it was related to him, I can't remember how it was, um, but there was an explosion at the Lockwood Mills and he dies from the explosion. There's also one, because uh, we're thinking about Farmington, there was also one in 1953 on Dalton Street where, where a young female, um, home by herself, was down in the cellar to get something, she flicks the switch and off, and the house blows up. Was that? Yeah. 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 It was, it was, a lot of these stories are really sad to read. And the thing about reading some of these, especially, you know, in the 1800s and the 1900s, when, um, well, especially in the 1800s, when you had the water mill and Eastern Mill, they, they didn't put a whole lot of pictures in there, but they really told you the story so you can picture it in your mind, and sometimes they got really graphic and really bad. Okay. In the fire department incident today, I, I told you, you know, we, uh, we average almost 12 calls a day. We had 4,231 calls last year. So it's a busy department. It, it, it runs uh, a lot. Today we had a, a restaurant.
rescue at the uh, Devil's Chair. Uh, a gentleman was climbing up the side of, the, I don't know if you know what Devil's Chair is. It's, it's, it's a quay road, it's a big cliff, and there was a guy halfway up, and he, and he, he almost fell off of it. He, they called 911. We went there, and of course, did all the, the fun stuff for repelling and stuff. <laughs> They got them off. You probably you'll probably see stories on that. That was today. So we do. We don't just fight fires. We do, you know, below grade rescue, high angle rescue. Um, you know, just about anything we do, and we still do cat calls. <laughs> <laughs> Four weeks ago, we did a cat call over um, off of St. Gravina. We went to get the cat. She jumped in the next tree and went down. <laughs>